Hey, everybody! Welcome to episode number 555 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Longtime friend of the show, Matt Burns, is joining me this week to talk about the future of embedded design. We investigate the role that PAM4 will play in this arena, the benefits that SOMs and COMs bring to the embedded design ecosystem, and why faster data rates and increased functionality will be driving forces in the future of embedded applications. So, without further ado, please welcome Matt to Fish Fry. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, it's good to see you. It's been a long time since we've seen you in person. I know, that's true. So, Matt, we're talking about enabling the embedded technology of tomorrow. So, what exactly are you seeing in this space in particular? In three words? Uh, More than three words. (laughs) Well, I'm going to start out with three. How about that? Faster, smaller, denser. You know, that may sound like an oversimplification, Amelia, but that's really what we're seeing in Embedded. You know, one of the things that's really driving that is data rates. Data rates are always getting faster. One of the things that Samtech's seen working through PCI SIG is the constant doubling of PCI Express technology, roughly doubling every three years. Earlier in 22, PCI 6.0 was released, which is 64 gigatransfers per second. The marking release of PCI 7, which will probably be ready for market in 2025, gets us up to 128 gigatransfers per second. Obviously, those are typically found in the data center. Right now, in the embedded space, we're probably looking at PCI 4, PCI 5. But in any case, PCI 5 has really been a focus uh, with embedded only within the last, call it, 6 to 12 months because of native support on chipsets available. So that's just one example of the speed. Uh, When it comes to density, we see a number of of different compute engines that are available. It's not just x86 architectures anymore, right? We're looking at x86, we're looking at FPGAs, we're looking at RFSOCs, we're looking at uh, GPGPUs, TPUs, you know, which are coming out of Google and and some AI providers. So it's increased functionality in, in a much tighter space. So not only is it, how do I get all the IO out of the chipset, but how do I get all the IO to the memory, to the power, to the I.O., and how do I get the expansion to the connector to get down to a carrier card? So the connectors have to be tighter, uh, they have to be smaller, but they have to support more I.O. and more power. That really ties into smaller. You know, the smaller being, how can we get the pitch of the pins closer and closer? So we're seeing that across the standards bodies. Pick, make, com, HPC is a good example of how those things tie together. But we're also seeing it in working with SOM and COM vendors where they're creating their own de facto standards that are being adopted across multiple customers. So it's, it's a real interesting time to be an embedded right now. That's true. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about PAM4 in the industry now and in the future. PAM4 is all about getting more data at the same carrier frequency or the same Nyquist frequency. So PAM4 refers to pulse amplitude modulation four level. So instead of having a zero at zero volts and a one at 3.3 or whatever your VCC is, you actually have uh, four levels of voltages. So you can go zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So it allows you to get two bits of data per clock cycle instead of one but you don't have to double the bandwidth. So we talked earlier about PCI Express. So if you look at PCI Express 5, it's a 32 gigatransfer per second technology with a Nyquist frequency at 16 gigahertz using NRZ encoding. For PAM 6, we're getting up to 64 gigatransfer per second, but we're still using the same Nyquist frequency at 16 gigahertz because we're able to, to get twice the data throughput using the same frequency. Now, there's some SNR issues, signal noise ratio issues you have to worry about on the transceiver and the receiver end, but those are easily uh, handled because of the advances in the transceiver technology that we have on the silicon transceivers. So that PAM4 technology that PAM4 encoding has been used in the data center applications probably for about the last five to seven years. And now we're starting to see it get into the embedded space just because the need for more data is there. Absolutely. Now, there is a major driving force in the embedded arena, and that's the use of SOMs or system on modules or COMs, computers on modules. So what kind of benefits do you think are inherent here? The short answer is it it provides a prototype to production platform. So if I'm an OEM and whatever industry in the embedded space, it could be medical, it can be industrial, it could be, you know, automotive transportation, mill era, whatever the case may be, 
I want to focus on the value add that I bring to an end market application. That may be software based, that may be hardware based, that may be my time to market or some IP that I have for a specific application. I don't want to spend the time designing a digital compute engine that any number of other companies can already make. So that's really the value add of a computer on module or system on module. You get the compute engine that you want with all the support circuitry in a standard package. And that support circuitry typically entails the power, the memory, the IO, sensors, whatever the case may be. So you buy the off the shelf COM or SOM, you do your development, whether that's using an off the shelf carrier card or baseboard or something that an OEM creates themselves. And then nine to 15 or nine to 18 months later, you have a, a solution that, that's ready to go and you've compressed your development time from six to 12 months. So, you know, not only are we seeing customers or OEMs designing their own SOMs and COMs, but we're also seeing standard SOMs and COMs. And, and specifically for embedded COM Express or COM E as it's known has really been the workhorse of embedded COMs for probably the last 15 years or so. But the new PICMIG COM HPC standard is really designed to leverage a lot of these trends, smaller, faster, denser for embedded applications for next gen speeds. So COM HPC was released to the market in 2021, and we really expect 2023 to be the hockey stick effect. So all the designs that the OEMs and the embedded boards manufacturers have been working on are going through validation and testing. We expect to see them hit production later this year. So what is Samtech doing in the COM HPC space? Well, we're the connector manufacturer. <laughs> so that's the simple answer. But a lot of work went into enabling it. It wasn't just a matter of taking a, an off-the-shelf connector and then throwing it into the standard. It was when the COM HPC technical working group started working on the idea of a technical successor or next generation technical successor of, of COM E, it was really about understanding the functionality. Call me at the time got you to, to PCI 3, 8 gigatransfers transfers per second. There's been some additional things that that working group has done to get you to PCI 4, but that's all the fast you can get in that form factor. So COMHPC, when it came out in the market, it already started out with, at PCI 5 with a roadmap to PCI 6. Another popular interface for embedded modules is, is Ethernet. COMI was looking at using 10G per channel. Now with COMHPC, we can get up to 25G per channel. So it's very easy to implement 4x25 or 100 gigabit Ethernet on a, a COMHPC module that you couldn't with COMI. So, you know, where Samtech came in is, you know, we've been a part of the technical working group since the beginning, several years ago, and we were working with the semiconductor providers, the embedded computing providers to define the, the interconnect, define the, the pinout, and then also to work on the SI analysis, which is, we have available to show that the performance not only was theoretical, but also practical. All right, Matt, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter. If you need a passport to get there or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? I've never had Russian caviar, and I've always wanted to have it, but I don't know if I can right now for a number of reasons. But it's something I, I've always wanted to have. So maybe in the future, that's something that will be available. I don't know. I apologize if that offends anyone's sensitivities. But it's something I I've always wanted to have. And hopefully I can have, like James Bond, sturgeon, caviar, and, and Bollinger champagne. Seems like the thing to do. I don't know. There you go. Excellent. Well, as always, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me, Matt. Thank you, Amelia. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Speaking of connectivity solutions, I have a super cool new Chalk Talk with Samtech that you should check out. In this episode, I chat with Matt Burns about a variety of crucial design considerations for AI and machine learning designs. The role that AI chipsets will play in the development of these systems, and why the right connectivity solution can make all the difference when it comes to your next machine learning or artificial intelligence design. And you can check out this episode of Chalk Talk by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com or by clicking the link in the description in this week's YouTube episode as well. Well, folks, that's all I have for this week's Fish Fry. But I have some super cool interviews lined up in the coming weeks, including a chat with ITEA's Sasan Montessori about the challenges of edge device real-time data management and the best security practices for embedded IoT data management. 
I also interview Flux CEO Matthias Wagner about how Flux is using AI to flip the script on the PCB game and making PCB design easier, faster, and more fun than ever before. And I also investigate where TDK's Invencence sensors will be used in the upcoming Olympics. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcast platform to listen to these exciting upcoming episodes. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X or Twitter, whatever it is, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you'd like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I mentioned earlier, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of October 27th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.